Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is a founder of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our next episode from the Lessons from the Playroom podcast. I have with me an extraordinary guest today to talk about an incredibly important topic for all of us as play therapists to be thinking about on a regular basis. Um, we are going to be talking about um, multiculturalism in play therapy. And if you don't already have her book, I hope that you will go buy her book uh, by the end of this podcast. But I have with me D. Ray. Many of you may be familiar with D. Ray and her work. She's been in our field uh, doing extraordinary things for quite a while now, influencing and teaching so many of us. D. I am so excited that you are here and that we get to talk about multiculturalism in play therapy. So thank you so much for being here and for joining me. I'm excited to be here and it's fun to be asked. So yeah. yeah, I know your podcast has such a great reputation. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you so much. And um, and do you, in the event that there's someone who is not familiar um, with you, I want to share a little bit about you just to orient our listeners um, into who you are a little bit. So um, D. Ray is a Regents professor and Elaine Milliken, is it... Mathis. Mathis, Professor in Early Childhood Education and the Counseling Program and Co-Director of the Center for Play Therapy at the University of North Texas. And play therapists around the world, you probably know that University of North Texas is really in, in many ways one of the um, really like the crux of where so much of our play therapy research and information comes out of. So um, you are you are part of um, the hub, <laughs> one of the primary hubs. Um, Dr. Ray has published over 150 articles, chapters, and books in the field of play therapy. Dr. Ray is author of A Therapist's Guide to Development, Advanced Play Therapy, Playful Education, and co-author of Multicultural Play Therapy. She's a founding board member and past president of the Association for Child and Adolescent Counseling, as well as current board chair of the Program for Child-Centered Play Therapy and Child-Parent Relation, uh, Relationship Therapy. Dr. Ray additionally operates the counseling practice Empathy Well in Highland Village, um, Texas, where she facilitates play therapy training and supervision. So, I, I mean, truly, you've done so many things um, for us in the field. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Judy. Thank you. It's, it's yeah. a life mission, right? Like it's everything about my life is something to do with play therapy. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it, it shows and we are all impacted and grateful as a, as a result of that. And we're talking about multiculturalism um, today. So how, how did this topic become so important to you? Enough to write a book, what, co-write co a book. You've got two co -write other, a book, yes. Yeah, you've got two other really important yeah. authors um, in this contribution as well. Yeah, and that's why, you know, I'm always a little nervous when I come by myself um, to do, to talk about this topic because it, everything I do in multiculturalism is, is multiple people are, um, we're kind of working on it together and hope to talk about that a little bit today, but, um, yeah, like, so I think, um, you know, my background is, um, obvious in terms of my race and I'm white and, um, uh, identify as a woman, uh, and so in the play therapy world, that is the most common um, intersection is to have uh, white women make up the majority of play therapists. And so that's, that's always been noticeable to me, like even like, so I guess I started in the more professional in terms of being a part of the organization of Association of Play Therapy and all of that back in 1998. 
And it was very noticeable that, and even worse then in terms of everybody kind of looked like me, right? Like, uh, and, and then I would go home and the children I'm serving, because I've mostly served um, diverse groups of children and in uh, multiple settings and in community settings and school settings and all of that. And so that always, there was always something incongruent about that that felt inconsistent with me. Um, so I think that's, that's something that started to kind of grow in me that, hey, something's not right here. Something doesn't seem right about this. And then over time, then getting more and more experience in terms of working with um, children of diverse and intersectional identities and seeing that, oh yeah, I'm missing um, knowledge and I'm missing uh, experiences and, and needing to understand about like how do people um, who come from various cultural identities, how, how do they experience play therapy? And um, so that's kind of the beginnings of it. And then it, the other part of my job is I teach. And so I'm um, having students come through. We've been very fortunate at the University of North Texas to have a lot of diversity of students, both um, culturally within the U.S. and then also internationally. And so we have a lot of international um, students come in. And so that that was always very eye opening. I was the director of the clinic, their experiences, because we are in the middle of um, you know, I don't want to pick on my area because there's certainly areas uh, across the United States that are limited in how people look at other people. But, you know, um, in our area, it, it is, uh, we have a lot of, you know, kind of have racial bias. I feel bad I'm talking bad about Texas, but I'm not, I, I don't think that we're unique in that, unfortunately. But, um, but we would have clients come in and then our play therapist would experience um, racism and bias and um, from our clients. And so that was always very, um, again, very eye-opening and then trying to work with counselors on that and trying to, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to, I forgot to turn off my email. So I'm going to do that really quickly. Oh, so it doesn't right. beep while we're talking. Um, but um, then, you know, then I'm trying to help. How do you train play therapists who are multicultural backgrounds and so that they feel competent and that they are dealing with constant um, microaggressions, actual overt racism, like, you know, working with them on that. And that's where it came into, I could go on, I'll try not to talk on and on before you ask another question, but, um, but that's where um, the co-authors of this book, um, Yumi Ogawa and Ilu Chang, come into the picture because um, Yumi and I've known each other. She was a student at UNT like over 20 years ago. She's a very experienced and seasoned um, play therapist trainer now. But, um, and then Iru, uh, you know, over, I think it's been probably almost 15 years that we've known each other. So uh, we started having conversations, a lot of conversations, which really took off um, during the pandemic and also during the race reckoning um, that was occurring in the US that um, we started regular, we had already had a lot of talks about culture and what, how it affects play therapy and the limitations in of um, play therapist culturally. And what could we do? How can we make differences? The three of us had had a lot of conversations already. We're very close. And, um, and then that just kind of took off um, when we had time to spend together on Zoom. And so we met regularly throughout the pandemic and we're like, hey, we need to write down some of these things. We need to really write down these conversations and how important they are and what they mean. And can we make a difference in play therapy? And so that, that kind of came together. And then on the other hand, about four years ago, it's for a lot, for at least six years, I have wanted to change up the play therapy room um, because the play therapy room, um, as much as I respect and admire the my predecessors and the people that came before, um, they do come from a very kind of middle class white background, and so when we're bringing children into the play therapy room, that was feeling limiting. That was feeling like, hey, I don't, I don't think we're hitting the mark here. I don't know what's happening here. And I'm then a lot of hesitation on my part. Is it is that should I be doing that? Like, do I know enough to do that? I don't think that I know enough to do that. So I kind of kept away from it. And then the thing, it's kind of like how the universe works in these amazing ways. 
that students came in who were brought in um, just because they wanted play therapy training, but they also had this multicultural focus and three of them particularly, um, which is uh, Regine Chung and um, Crystal Turner and Elizabeth Aguilar came in and that's what their focus, they wanted to do, hey, we wanna do something with the play therapy room. And I'm like, oh my God, it's come together. We can, we can figure this out. And so the four of us have been a research team for the last four years on trying to figure out what needs to be happening in the play therapy room to be more culturally inclusive and how do we need to change um, what's in the play therapy room to be more culturally inclusive. So you asked a very easy question and I gave a very long answer. So I apologize for that, no, <laughs> but that's kind of where so it is perfect. right now. Yeah. Well, it's so perfect. And and even just the the community, they're talking about just the, it's a, it's a community mm -hmm. conversation and it sounds like it's been an ongoing discovery and an ongoing process, ongoing conversation, which is part of what the learning uh, around this topic, in, in my opinion, is, is yeah. you know, is all about. So let's make sure, you now we're going to get into, you know, multicultural, like the therapist and what the therapist needs to be aware of and how the therapist can be thinking about um, multicultural play, um, mm -hmm. play therapy. But let's also come make sure to come back to the room itself, because yeah. my guess is that some of our listeners would be really interested in hearing um, a bit about that. So let's just start with like the broad topic. What is it? Like, how would you define multicultural play therapy? Multicultural play therapy, offering the intervention of play therapy from a culturally inclusive lens. Like, how do we make what we offer available to all people and, and speaking to all children? Um, and this is, you know, culture is so wide. It's so much even bigger than race and gender and just so many identities that our children are coming in with. And so multicultural play therapy is, are we offering an intervention that a child feels like, oh, this is my room, right? Like we, we kind of make an assumption of that, of, oh, the child's going to feel a place of belonging here, but do they? Like, do I send out messages of cultural inclusivity um, in the way that I speak, in the way that I am non-verbally, in the way that I present myself, in the way that I am in the room? Is the room itself culturally inclusive? It's, it's you know, how do we you know, the thing that we all want, which is how does a, a child have a sense of belonging in the room? Are we really doing that if we're not considering culture? So multicultural play therapy is, yeah, that is part of when I, if I want a child to really feel a part of this experience and feel a sense of belonging, then everything about it has to be culturally inclusive. And I have to be very aware of that. And so to me, that's what multicultural play therapy is. Mm -hmm. So when you begin to educate play therapist on this and a play therapist says where do I start like mm -hmm. how do I even begin to think about this topic for myself where do you where do you start well I think the starting point is something that people this is nice to see it's been coming up in the play therapy conferences and, and across the um, across the world and certainly across the U.S. about cult, the, this term called cultural humility. And to me, that's the starting point. That is um, cultural humility, you know, has those kind of two pieces to it from a multicultural framework, which is that, that intrapersonal piece where am I doing my work? You know, we say these phrases. I really like to stay away from a lot of the phrases. I can't do the work. Um, but it really is doing the intra part, the intrapersonal part of cultural humility is am I doing my work? Do I, do I really recognize um, when things are triggered for me around culture? Like, do I Am I getting like something happens in the playroom or outside the playroom that something happens and I get an automatic thought, which is just normal, right? Like I think a lot of play therapists beat themselves up or or something about, oh, that's wrong, but that's normal because we're raised in a society that's biased and has a lot of discrimination. So to have kind of um, instant thoughts um, that come in is normal what what we um but what we want to do with them is start to examine them i want to let them into my awareness i want to see oh wow where did that come from um wow that's came from something that a parent said when i was seven years old and i'm still carrying it around um but i want to examine it and see it at for what it is is about yeah this was part of my upbringing this is part of the messages that have been sent to me through the wider culture and, and it's a problem, right? And so, and not feeling, you know, generally what I find with play therapists is we have kind of 
reactions that maybe not the not the most helpful in terms of we'll sometimes have a denial reaction. Well, that was wrong and I shouldn't think that. And so I'm just not going to think that anymore, which is not helpful because I need to be able to examine like, where did this come from? Why is it there? Why is it still here when I'm 55 years old? <laughs> you know, why, why is it coming up? Or they'll have the, oh, you know, that's okay. Now I'm going to make everything better and I'm going to make sure there's no more racism ever and blah, 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 you know, and, and that's not helpful either. Cause then you move into that kind of savior mode of yeah. all of that. And so really trying to um, examine and that intrapersonal piece of cultural humility about wait, where are my blind spots and where, 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 where should I start looking at things more carefully for what's happened for me. And then the interpersonal to me is, is this huge piece that really fit when you know when you study multicultural orientation is this idea cultural humility interpersonally is about my curiosity about others and me not placing my like not placing myself over others in terms of my beliefs or what I see or my values or how I live my life is in some way better than how others do. Um, so interpersonally is, is being very curious in terms of how other people see the world, how they see their values, how they see they, how they how they live their life in um, consistency with their values. And seeing that as, oh, wow, that it's really cool, right? <laughs> like, that's really cool. They very much see things very differently than me. And I'm curious about that. And I want to know their world. And again, that's not about, oh, I want to know about this group or that group. I want to know about this person within how they um, culturally identify. Mm -hmm. So the word cultural humility, I know that many of our listeners may be familiar with. And one of the other words that you use in your book, which I hear less people talk about, is cultural opportunity. Yeah. Would you describe the difference between cultural humility and cultural opportunity? Because I, I know that the the language is it's important language, and for yeah. us to, to know both. Yeah, and I want to make sure I give you know because I'm an academic, so I have to do citations. But um, but uh, I want to make sure I give credit to Owen. Um, you know, Owen group of the research group that studies multicultural orientation, which has been, you know, kind of my theoretical framework for this. But it's this idea of cultural humility as the cornerstone. Like I can't get anywhere until I'm looking at myself, wanting to know about others, seeing how I, I can elevate others' experiences. Um, that's the cornerstone. And then if I have that, then I start to see more cultural opportunities. Whereas, I, so I'm not busy defending whatever's going on for me culturally. I am now fully into another person's world and I can kind of grab onto those cultural opportunities, which is my willingness to engage in cultural conversations, cultural play, um, anything that the child is bringing up culturally, I'm willing to engage in that. And so I use an example of, because it, 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 I think for play therapists, it's easy to ignore those things in the, in the play therapy. If we're not, if we're not, if we don't have good awareness or, um, if I'm nervous or defensive or any of those kind of things, then I won't engage in those opportunities and children are throwing them at us all the time. Like they're, they're coming out all the time. And, um, you know, and they're very simple, like I, just sharing the story of I was walking um, I was actually coming back from the playroom with a child and he was a Latino um, six year old boy and we're walking along and I'm, I'm, I'm a very um, pale person and um, and he was his skin's darker than mine and we're walking along and we're kind of playing we were playing that game where you go um, where you walk into the squares of the tiles right as you're walking down and we we're walking that and but our hands kind of just like hung beside each other and he's looking at my hand and we're both looking at this part of the hand the back hand the back part of the hand and um and he looks at he stops and our hands are kind of swinging together and he stops and he looks at both of our hands together and he says oh and then he flips his hand because his 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 palm is is lighter than mine. And so I mean lighter than his his backhand. And so the palm he puts next to my hand and he says, Oh, look, we're the same. And so, you know, there's so much that goes into that when you talked about cultural humility you know, an instant thought might, might be, oh gosh, no, no, no. Um, I don't want you to feel like you have to be lighter, right? Like that can be that defensive piece, but really recognizing, oh, wow, he's trying to tell me something here and he has matched something about our relationship with culture. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I looked at him and I'm like, oh, you wanted us to be the same. 
And then I flipped my, you know, hand over to you and I like, and sometimes we're the same and sometimes we're different. And so being able to tell him, yeah, we can be in this relationship together, but we don't have to look the same. And then you, and you don't have to look different to be important to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, and I, and I followed up with, and the relationship's important to me too, you Mm -hmm. know? And so, um, so being able to kind of speak to that, that to me is a cultural opportunity to engage in. Otherwise I'm, you know, if I'm not operating from humility, then I miss the opportunity. I might be like, oh no, well, look, we're just the same. Oh, look, yeah, no, like, but no, recognizing, no, there are differences between us and, and you see this, this is important to you. When you look at me, you see the color of my skin and the color of your skin. And that means something to you. So I want to be able to engage in that with them. So that's like, like the, the grasping of cultural opportunities. How can I, how can I move, lean into those? And Would you um, just be willing to name some of the common fears that come up for play therapists when they when they think about leaning in? And because I, I think sometimes it's just helpful to name what are the, what are the fears that 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 show up in these in these moments that prevent us from being able to really connect with yeah. ourselves and connect with the child. So many, right? And they're going to be different. Like one of the things I found too, working with um, play therapists of color is there, there are different fears that come up when yeah. these situations come up. So, so many different ones. So speaking from to my perspective in terms of my identities, um, the fears are, am I going to say the wrong thing, right? Am I going to say the wrong thing and the child's going to feel bad about themselves and their culture? Am I going to um, you know, make it worse, basically, right? Am I contributing to all the discrimination that goes on in our wider culture? And um, I think that's a really big fear. Um, the other is really not even a thought through fear. I think it's this automatic fear and that has increased over the last few years is just a frozenness, just a, oh, wait, we don't talk about that, right? Like, look, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about any of that because that's bad and people are going to get their feelings hurt and things are going to be bad. So let's not talk about it. So it's not even, the fear is more of this automatic response of freezing. Of, okay. And so I'll just reflect, you're excited about that, right? <laughs> like I won't, I won't get, lean into the opportunity because I'm like, oh, we don't talk about that. So that, you know, that's a fear. I think, um, I think when you don't, like accept yourself. And that's a lot of stuff I talk about in play therapy is that unconditional positive self-regard. When you don't accept yourself, it's hard. Uh, there's a lot of fear of leaning into these conversations because it would be about, oh, wow, I really am racist. Or I, I really am. Um, I really do have biases. That's bad. I'm bad. Um, so I'm not going to engage in these conversations because it would be too hard for me to look at my own biases. Um, so I think that's a fear and it's a very kind of um, subtle fear that a lot of people don't want to look at, but I do see it. Um, and then when I, I know with my, I don't want to speak for uh, people that I work with, but I know what has been shared with me is um, for play therapist of color, there is this fear of what's coming after that, like, is the child going to, um, because there has been so much racism experienced and microaggressions experienced, is the child going to, is this going to affect the relationship that I'm going to lean into this race thing and, or, you know, whatever it is, whatever identity is, I'm going to lean into it. And the child is going to see me as only my race or only this identity. And um, so I, I don't want to really go into it for that reason, um, because it'll be it, it'll be opening the door to more racism that I've already experienced my whole life. Right. Like, I, I think. Um, and again, I'm very hesitant to speak for people that I've worked with. I'm just sharing some of the things that have been shared with me, um, because I do think we kind of come from these different perspectives when we come in and, and different dynamics are happening in the playroom. I, I so appreciate you just normalizing this whole process that I mean things come up thoughts come up you know reactions come up and Mm -hmm. and so it's it's not about somehow preventing that because that's almost prevent you like you can't in 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 many Mm -hmm. ways but then but how do we stay really curious and how do we stay really um, introspective um, about Mm -hmm. it and and really questioning so I'm saying that to lead into my next question which is okay so 
there's a moment when something is said and and it doesn't land well and mm-hmm. it and it, and it and there's something about something that is that does land hurtful um how do you go about repair when yeah. there has been a, a a rupture um how do you go about repair well to me that is where the cultural humility and the third pillar around cultural comfort comes in is recognizing I'm going to make mistakes that that's going to happen. And I'm, and my comfort level needs to be high enough that I can recognize those mistakes and, and speak to them. Right. Like, so, and, and this is definitely within the cultural realm, but in the broader sense of play therapy too, to me, authenticity is everything in play therapy. And so that is where the play therapist needs to be coming from to have, you know, therapeutically changing relationships. And when I make a mistake, being able to, you know, you've got, you know, so so these are things you've experienced, we've all experienced in play therapy of, oh, I said something and I know immediately that was messed up. Like that that was not right. You're like, oh goodness. And then I, right. And then you've got the experience of, Oh, well, when I'm laying in my bed at night, I realized, oh man, that was not okay. I should have, that did not work. So again, like how you go about um, going back and and what I would say comes into the uh, part of uh, repairing, right? And repairing. And um, it's it's leaning into that authenticity of that's got to come from cultural humility, cultural comfort. And then that gives you a cultural opportunity of, Okay, so when I say something, being like, ooh, I didn't mean to say that. I actually have said that in play therapy, like where the child will do something, I will say something, it's way off, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, that's not what I meant. I, and I'll say, I'm, I'm sorry, that is not at all what I meant. Um, here's what I meant. Or, oh, I said that the wrong way, and I think you might have heard it this way. I have those conversations with children. I, I find a lot of play therapists are like, really? You say it? I'm like, absolutely. Like, you know, in any relationship that you're in in life, we I actually just had this conversation in supervision today um, <laughs> about in any relationship in life, we're people, so we make mistakes, and that doesn't matter like wherever you're coming from, whatever your identity is, you're going to make mistakes in your relationships. That's just how humans work. But what are what's the broader message that you're sending of I care and I, I value and I want to know your world? Then I'm that's the part that our clients are so amazing and children are so amazing at. Yeah, you can make your thirty second um, mistake. Uh, but they're seeing you in the context of all the other things that you're providing that you want to provide them. So they give us a lot of leeway and they, um, so first of all, I think the first thing is I do, I'm like, okay, it's not the end of the world. I made this mistake. Um, because overall, I think it was just my limitation as a human, how I made the mistake. And so how in our relationship can I go back and repair this? And so now I'm going to go back into, Hey, that's not what I meant or, or, I said something and it, it was just wrong. Like it may not even be, that's not what I meant. Cause sometimes that's not the best answer. It is really is, it was just wrong. I don't, I, I didn't think it through. I wasn't sensitive to what it was. And so that was wrong. And I want to apologize. So I definitely um, have those conversations. Of course, those would be everybody's going to be like, do you say that to a four-year-old? No. I mean, it would be age appropriate (laughs) for what I would say, but I've definitely told four-year-olds, oh, I was wrong about that, right? Like, um, you know, and again, they're very forgiving in that. If if I'm practicing overall from this more humble place, then they're very much like, oh, yeah, that that's not what she's really like all the time. Yeah. Thank you. Does that address what you were saying? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I'm just, I'm just thinking through just the the different questions that listeners might have as mm-hmm. as we're just hearing you share here, and and I know that's a fear of, oh, yeah. what if I rupture? And then there's a fear of I don't, I don't even know what repair could look like. And so yeah. I appreciate you just offering a possibility of what you know what repair could look like. But yeah, um, I talk about that a lot with kids, yeah. and and again, when you're talking about like if you have especially like cultural differences and and making mistakes culturally, where is it that a child who has had it, let's say a child who has experienced um, bias or discrimination, where are they going to get an adult that comes to them and says, hey, I messed that up. I really messed that up. 
And what an amazing opportunity for them to see, oh, adults can be this way, right? Like uh, people can be like this too. Because again, kids are so forgiving in that. And so, and and what a great opportunity because all they you know typically see from adults is defensiveness or authoritarianism or that kind of thing. When they see an adult come in saying, oh man, you know, I just did not do that well. <laughs> um, then um, that is such a great thing for them to see of, oh, this is how relationships could work. And when people, some people who do things that hurt me in terms of maybe make, doing some kind of microaggression, they, it allows them to see that, oh, okay, that's their, that's that person's limitation. That's not about me. That's not about like, you know, that doesn't have a meaning about my worth um, because they just took responsibility for it, that it was on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's go um, to one concentric sphere more out and talk about the family. So mm -hmm. when we're thinking about multiculturalism and play therapy, how do we begin to think about it in the context of the family system or working with parents and caregivers as well? Yeah. Well, I think it's too hard, so we just don't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, that's a, you know, that's tough because, um, you know, one of the things about working with children, and, and this is like one of the exercises that I do with play therapists to, to get them thinking along those lines is, you know, and so if anybody's at home and wants to do this now, I think it's a really good idea is that I just have people do, um, you know, them, they do a stick figure of themselves, a stick figure of the child and a stick figure of the parent. And then you write down all identities for each of those people. And that reminds you that your child is not typically completely identifying as the parent parent is has their own identity not identifying as a child and then you're identifying as you right and so and there and all these intersectional identities that are in and we have to balance and address and be sensitive to all of those right and that makes the job really hard which is why I said let's just avoid the question no but it makes the job hard because I don't want to just see the identities of the child. I do need to see the identities of the multiple people in the family. Um, what are their values? And again, when you're um, like when we work with a lot of intergenerational families in terms of immigration. And so, you know, you have a parent who has these particular identities and the child has very different identities. And, and then how do we hold value for what the parent and how they see themselves and how they want their child raised? that hold value for what the child, how they identify and what they need and what they want. And so again, I'm back to a lot of cultural humility on my part of not choosing because that would not be humble, right? Like for me to say, well, the parent is more important or the child's identity is more important, but seeing it, no, 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 they, they're in the most important relationship of their lives. So my job is to be as humble as possible and then try to elevate both of how they identify and then how they communicate that. And then when I'm giving services, making sure I'm very sensitive to this is how the parent sees themselves or parents or siblings see themselves. And this is how my child sees themselves and how can I help with that communication? So a lot of it is when we do, when I do um, family activities is bringing that out too. Because culture, well, if you allow culture to come out, it comes out pretty um, pretty well, right? People do like to present themselves of here's, and especially if you're working with families. And so again, leaning into, okay, so mom, you're seeing yourself as, you know, um, you want your child to continue, just for example, you want your child to continue speaking Spanish and um, holding on to your Catholicism and following that, you know, I'm kind of speaking to a particular client right now. And um, that holding on to the Catholicism and making sure that that drives your family values. And then this eight-year-old who has no interest in speaking Spanish and is embarrassed about the families because, again, they're on their own cultural journey um, because that's a developmental thing is your cultural identity is developmental. So they're on their own culture. So they might be at a stage where they're like, oh, I'm not going to speak any Spanish and I don't want to go to church. And um, and so how do we bring those together so that the, all the values are um, respected? And, and again, I talk about it very Pollyanna-ish about, oh yeah, just bring it up and that'll be great. Um, but now really trying to kind of get them to hear each other. And in the end, if the, you know, the parents do the parental thing and, but can they also respect their child wanting something different, even if they keep the same, um, you know, traditions and, and how they handle things. Yeah. 
you know, I, I'm hearing you, you were saying that for you, that authenticity is one of the key pieces for us as play therapists, but I'm also hearing that it sounds like that's almost a, a treatment goal. Um, also, uh, from, from, from this perspective of how do we really support the authenticity of each of the family members, um, the child, the, 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 you know, the, the caregiver, and that each, each individual, the family gets to be authentic within their identities. And how do, yeah. we, how do we hold that? Does, does that feel accurate? Yeah. I don't want to. Well, I love, I love how you're conceptualizing it as a treatment goal. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, yeah. I think that is it. I did. Cause to me, that is the core of relationships is with everybody with, you know, our professional relationships, but our personal relationships is how do we communicate with each other who we really are and, um, and, and trust each other that we can hold that for each other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's jump over to the playroom. Cause yeah. I said that it'd be fun to come, come back and talk about that. Yeah. So when we think about as play therapists, how do we uh, look at our playroom so that our, our, um, our playroom is able to, it's, it's, culturally sensitive it's culturally aware you know in and of itself what does that what does that look like what does that mean yeah that okay so so i'll just take the next 20 minutes no um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this has been the research agenda and, and actually you're telling like just a, it's been a long-term research agenda and we've been um, running research on what do people see as a multicultural playroom with um, participants who have multicultural intersectional identities. And um, so that's been a huge piece of what I've been working on with the, the uh, play therapy um, research team. And just two weeks ago, um, for the first time at the University of North Texas in 40 years, uh, we changed the rooms. And um, and I'm kind of scared to tell you about it because now we're going to run a research study to see does it make a difference? Because mm -hmm. we're not just doing it. We're going to be like, okay, so does it make a difference? So Crystal Turner, who is one of our doctoral students, is going to be researching this about is it going to make a difference? So we're taking one room that is a traditional Gary Landreth toys are in this room. Um, and we, then we have a matching multicultural room where we have changed what's in the room. And then we're going to look at how children are engaging in the materials. So just tell you, we're in, in the middle of that. Which is, oh, it's very exciting. We spent an entire, it was um, 10 hours two weeks ago after spending many, many hours on coming up what would go into this room. But we used research um, from participants to say what should go in the room. And um, because I'll just say traditionally, what has been the go-to, especially in the child centered play therapy world has been, okay, well, if your population is this, just make sure you have these dolls, right? Like or if you, um, if this is what your population, and that just doesn't cut it anymore because our children are so diverse and identities are so intersectional. Like we've got, you know, religious and gender and race and all the, these identities coming together. And so it just doesn't cut it to say, okay, I'm going to put, you know, dolls of this shade in the room. And that's really how traditionally um, play therapy has operated. So what we did is we went into each category and, and what we were looking for is how to help children have a sense of belonging and in the room, how to have a, a sense of pride and also um, challenges like how culturally can they uh, identify things in the room that help them, you know, express or understand pride and challenges and then expression. So we were looking at those things about when children come to the room, can they do that? And so the child, uh, so what we've done is we've put a multiple number of international, cultural, um, race, gender, all kinds of, um, we went into the diversity of sensory, um, neurodiversity, different kind of things in the room to try and capture if a child walks into this room, they are going to see a world of diversity and which is the world they live in. And so then can they use the room more effectively? Um, because it, it might or might not, what we hope is we've offered something to all children, but it's almost impossible, right? To make sure you have like, you know, definitely a discussion was, are we going to have 26 dolls in the room that are all different? You know, like these were all huge discussions that we had, or are we sending the message through the entire room that this room can be a lot of different things and, and it can fit any kind of child. Uh, and 
adapted in the way that you needed, which I think um, that is what our goal was. And that's what, um, but I can't tell you whether we met the goal because that's what we're going to look at. Um, but it really is, are, do you have, you know, if you're doing it right now as a play therapist, do you have materials in your room that a child sees their world in, right? And, and you know, and children don't live in a monochromic world, a chromatic world. They live in a diverse world. And so um, do we have things in there that, oh, this is something that reminds me of religion, so I could explore that in here. Oh, this is something that reminds me of gender, so I could explore that in here. This is something that reminds me of race, I could explore that in here. This And, and you know, we're looking at diversity of food and, and uh, material, like just the touch of materials and having natural things in the room and having obviously um, uh, identifications with uh, certain cultures like uh, dress that cultures wear, food that people eat, dolls representing. So we went and um, so really it's a matter of the play therapist really being aware of that. Because again, when we did the study with the participants on, on making a multicultural play therapy room, it really, what was most important to them um, when we did the study was the play therapist. The play therapist is, you know, we can put any material material we want in the room it's not going to make a difference if the play therapist isn't intentional with their cultural inclusivity and so that's the first part is that we got to be taking care of the play therapist play therapists have to be working on their multicultural orientation their humility their comfort their leaning into opportunities but then part of doing that is then you're going to look at your room and be like Ugh, like no I need to <laughs> if I'm doing all of this I'm going to go into my room going oh this is a problem I need to kind of figure this out and then also about developing a multicultural play therapy room, don't do it in a silo. Don't do it isolated. Like do it. I cannot tell you these discussions. It's been oh easily a hundred hours this past year just in the discussion group of the research team of what do we think? You know, we hold up a toy or pull up a toy on Amazon and be like, what do we think about this? <laughs> and what would this mean to this child, to any child? What would it mean to particular children? Um, and then being able to do that in a consultation with other people is, to me, essential to that. You know what? Um, I, I'm just loving what you are saying so much. Um, the very first episode of this podcast is mm -hmm. on the therapist is the most important toy in the playroom. And I'm just yeah. like, you're, you're giving new meaning, right? So if we're yeah. looking at it from a multiculturalism you know, perspective, it's the therapists and their own work and, and their own cultural humility. And then the second is, what does your playroom say about you? Yeah. And, and so you're giving this other layer of a beautiful, like nuanced, for me, appreciation, understanding of our playrooms that, that when a child walks in, what they see is also an indicator of where we're willing to go. Yes. Yeah. And, and so if they don't see themselves in the room, what are we saying about where we are willing to go from a cultural perspective? Like what conversations are we not willing to have? Do we not want to have? Are we not comfortable having? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it goes back to that toys are their words, right? And so if I don't have certain things in there, I'm basically taking away words, which saying, hey, this is not okay to be talking about in here yeah. or playing with in here. Yeah, so, uh, so amazing. Um, I want to uh, hold up your book for those that are, mm -hmm. are, are, are watching, watching this and I'm just going to give a shout out because I said at the very beginning, but this is, um, this is the book everyone. Uh, for those of you that cannot see me holding this up right now, um, the, the book is called Multicultural Play Therapy. I'm assuming mm -hmm. D that, that play therapists can get it at the normal places where you yeah. would get, All the, it's, get your, yeah. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's uh, that Rutledge is the publisher. So you can get it from them, Taylor and Francis or at Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Or you can um, get it from the center. Sorry, I should say from the center for play therapy. You could also get it. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> yeah. I really believe that this is just, this is a book that just every single play therapist needs to, needs to read. It's just a phenomenal, a phenomenal book. And it's the Thank first you. of its kind. And it's just, it's really. It was a labor me. of love, like yeah. a complete labor of love of, from the beginning to end. Every author, because it's an edited book. So the chapters in it are just the m most amazing play therapist who just have the widest and broadest perspectives on multiculturalism. And yeah. And then of course, doing it with human E was a yeah. blessing. So. 
So as we are, are finding a, a place to find a stopping point in this conversation, but honestly, I could talk to you about this all day long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you, and you can tell I can too. Yeah, I love <laughs> Very just, chatty. I'm just, just, just loving this so much. Um, when, what, like what, what words of advice do you want to give to a play therapist? Maybe this is the first time they're thinking about it, or maybe it's kind of been in the back of their mind and now they're listening and they're like, okay, I really do need to think about this more. What do you, what, what would you share? Well, I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to be self-serving, but I do think the book is a good place to start yeah. um, because it'll really get people thinking about, hmm, maybe this isn't something I've thought about before, but um, yeah, to me going going to trainings because there are more trainings and the association for therapy now is promoting you know it's part of our requirements now to have cultural diversity training and so really seeking that out in very open ways of hey I just want to learn more and, and and look at myself more about what I need to change about me for this and um so yeah I think that so there's a lot to me the starting with a lot of introspection and and books and trainings can do that for um help facilitate that for you. But, but that, but then to me, I'm going to go back to kind of what I've been talking about, teaming, consulting, building relationships with peers who have different perspectives. Um, it's just essential and, and doing it in a way of, oh, I don't think my, my perspective is wrong, but in a way of, oh, wow, I can't he wait to hear other people's perspectives because I need to integrate those. Yeah. Um, but yeah, seeking out consultation, having those groups of people to talk to, and, and we have them. We do have play therapists of color and play therapists of various um, identities. And so really seeking those people out as colleagues, not to train you, not that they're responsible for you, but for you to be seeking out, hey, I want relationships to be broader and I want relationships, I want to understand more. Yeah, beautiful. And, uh, you know, I know today's conversation was about multicultural play therapy, um, but you also do uh, trainings just in, in, in general on many, many different topics. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to just share where people can just find more out about you, about trainings, whether it's at UNT or... Um, yeah, we do. Um, so about me, there's a lot. There's a lot about me. And um, the bit on the Center for Play Therapy website, um, cpt.unt.edu. Um, I think you're going to put that for the podcast. But um, and uh, so there's a lot about the trainings we do there, and um, we have child centered. And the Center for Play Therapy runs multicultural webinar series every year. We started that in 2020, and um, we're now in our. This will be our. Uh, fourth one. So uh, so that's coming up in the fall and it's a webinar. So anybody can go to that. So if you go to that website, you can find out about that. And then empathywell.com is my private practice. And we are always doing trainings and um, we have, well, we have one coming up in the fall and then we're going to have a whole slew of them in 2024. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. D, I really just can't thank you enough. Just, I mean, mm -hmm. for this conversation and then the research you're doing and that you've done and just really what you've contributed to the field of play therapy just just on behalf of all of us who have benefited from you thank you so much well thank you for having me i feel honored to be here so yeah. i appreciate it yeah mm. okay listeners um I, I know i said at the beginning i know we just talked about it five minutes ago but i'm gonna say it again go get this book <laughs> <laughs> this is a really, really important book uh, to 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 um, to begin your own conversations and to be be thinking about. Um, I hope that you will share this podcast also with whomever you feel like could also benefit from learning more about multiculturalism in play therapy. My hope is that you will have conversation with your colleagues, that uh, if you work in a training center or, you know, have conversation amongst uh, amongst each other, talk about your playrooms, you know, yeah. are all, of these, yeah. all of these different pieces that, that Dee is giving us some insight um, into. And wherever you are in the world, take care of yourselves, be well, and always a reminder that you're the most important toy in the in the playroom. So take care of your hearts, everyone. Until next time. For more information on our 
courses and our classes, please go to our website at synergeticplaytherapy.com and check out what we have available to you. And as always, remember that you're the most important toy in that playroom.